your liturgist for the day. And on behalf of Pilgrim, I want to welcome you, um, no matter who you are, no matter the state of your body, of your mind, of your soul, of your spirit, you are welcome here today. Regardless of whether you believe in God, as Pastor Michelle says, all of the time, some of the time, or not so much, we welcome you here. Particularly today, as we celebrate Pride Sunday, we want to lift up the fact that we welcome all people, regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation. And in the words of Kathleen Logis, if you ever heard someone whisper, is that a boy or a girl, you are welcome here. If you have ever been called a name based on your sexuality, you are welcome here. If you've ever seen people trying to judge and figure out your family configuration, you are welcome here. And to all of us, no matter what your experience, you are loved, you are welcomed, you are accepted here. Let us worship God. Good morning, Pilgrim. Good morning. It's lovely to see you all. Let's turn our hearts and our thoughts toward the work that we need to do as a body and spend this moment in confession. Too often we do not imagine what could be. Too often we feel that we cannot change the way that things are. That we cannot create sanctuary for the marginalized. We are tired. We are scared. And we become complacent. Help us imagine bolder and better and with more beauty. Too often we can't imagine thinking another way or feeling another way. We judge and jump to conclusions. We hang on to old beliefs and later realize that there may have been another perspective that we did not include. Help us to imagine others' perspectives, to see a bigger picture that starts with framing all thoughts in love. The gift of imagination is the gift of God, whereby we place faith in all that we hope for, and we trust in evidence that we can fully see. So to imagine is to create, to call and to be, to embrace the truth of God's power, God's patience, and God's pardon. And so it is that with these words that we lay claim to the mystery of our faith. We are loved, we are forgiven, and for that we say, Thanks, Pete. Good morning again. So this particular hymn is a brand new hymn for us to do. It's hymn, a new, a new uh, tune, text for us. It's, uh, you'll notice that it was written by uh, someone named Patrick Evans. And this was part of a competition, actually, for Pride Sunday. So we're excited to share this with you uh, today. I'm going to conduct it because I, I'd like to take a little time between each of uh, the stanzas. And Joe, if you wouldn't mind uh, playing through the entire piece for us, and say that you were able to join us in <laughs>
verses 26 through 39. It's on either page 68 or 82 in your pew Bible. Then they arrived at the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite to Galilee. As he stepped out on the land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wild. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now, there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen him told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. So it's usually about early to mid-October that the calls and the texts and the emails start coming in. And they are, Tim, when you get a minute, can we talk? Hey, Tim, there's someone that I really want you and Walt to meet. Tim, if you have, a, have some time, can we get some coffee? And I look at the calendar and I see that the holidays are just on the other side. And I know exactly what's going on. I know exactly what time it is. We are in coming out season. Thanksgiving is going to be that moment when somebody decides to let the whole family know that they are same gender loving. 
Christmas will be the time when another person looks up and says, we need to open up this whole question about gender because I need to tell you something. That New Year's ski trip that the big family takes is the proper time to introduce the partner who's been around for several years to the entire family. And so I sit with these sweet people and we kind of talk through these things. We run scenarios and we talk about mom and dad and Aunt Lucy and Uncle Fred and we guess how well it will go with this one or how poorly the other one might work through. And as we talk, I finally have to remind them of one detail that everybody seems to overlook. When we come out, we bring everyone with us. By its very nature, coming out is a group project. If you're not doing it to people who don't know what you've got to tell them, then there's no point in coming out at all. And I want to stop very quickly to say we're going to talk a whole lot about coming out, but I want us to broaden our, ask, our understanding of coming out. It's Pride Sunday, so there's a whole lot of queer stuff in this message. Get ready. But in the middle of it all, I want us to also think about coming out as divulging pieces of ourselves, truths that we might not feel comfortable sharing. Because we all come out in a million different ways. While those of us who come out have had plenty of time to sort of contemplate what we're going to say and lay the groundwork and you know, prepare and strategize for every kind of reaction, those on the receiving end just aren't that lucky. They may have suspicions, but suspicions are not knowledge. And all of a sudden we have handed them this information and expect them to say, well, all right, then let's just jump right on this train and get going. But coming out with someone is very hard work. Even for those who really are supportive, which is never guaranteed, they may not be too excited about a can of worms that you've opened up without a whole lot of permission. That seems to be the case of today's gospel. This tormented man at the center of the story is clearly ready to come out, even if the forces that are holding him captive and the people in the village aren't that happy about him being liberated from his distress. And though it's tucked between the lines, we can also discern that Jesus might not be too enthused about this situation, because before today's text starts, Luke tells us that Jesus comes to this place, this land of the Gasparines, as he, because he's on holiday. And so consequently, he gets off the ship, and the first thing that happens to him, bless his heart, the first thing that happens to him is, here comes somebody running up and saying, I know you're on vacation, but there's something I need to tell you. <laughs> so those of you that think that this, um, this, this tendency to wait until vacation to come out is a modern phenomenon, <laughs> it's been going on for a long time. Luke just parachutes us into the story. We don't know the man's name. We know nothing of his family, his background, his work, exactly what position he holds in the community. All of that seems to have got lost so long ago that it just doesn't even make it into print. Now this man is just the lunatic who hangs out in the dead and dry places. He's a cemetery person. The villagers can't seem to keep him in his clothes. They try to restrain him, but he won't be tied down. And he speaks in this strange, multiple personality kind of voice that calls itself Legion. Now, in describing the powers that hold him captive in this way, he uses a term that in Luke's time was unambiguously military. Legion was a number. It wasn't an abstract term. It totaled the specific number of Roman soldiers that were garrisoned in regions that Rome occupied, and it numbered 5,000 men. Nine companies of foot soldiers and one company of cavalry. And so when this man calls himself Legion, he essentially tells Jesus that the same forces that have colonized his homeland and crushed his people have somehow colonized his mind and crushed his spirit. 
The same systems of power that conspired to steal the land from under his family's feet have come and taken possession of his soul and stolen the very ground of his being. His identity, his freedom, his sense of dignity and worth have been removed and now remain outside his reach. This legion name is hewed with shades of political oppression and despotic tyranny. It's covered with the hints of economic injustice and moral bank bankruptcy, blunt violence, and brutal indifference. Everything about legion smacks of corruption. And yet even though the man self-identifies this way, Jesus knows better. Jesus knows the legion is not his real name. The tombs are not his true home. Running around unclothed and shouting is not the work that he would choose. Hiding out in dead places of despair is not what he longs for. Being out and recognized and known and loved and appreciated and respected, those are the things that his soul craves. And it's that craving that brings him to Jesus' feet. How the man came to be in this situation, nobody knows. That also goes unexplained. But it's suggested that something has happened to him. Luke says that his abnormal behavior has been going on, quote, for a long time, implying that it was not always this way. Maybe he had some kind of breakdown. Maybe he was predisposed to some kind of mental disorder. Maybe he was suffering from post-traumatic stress. We don't know and we can't say, but we have this sense that he's lost touch with who he's meant to be, that he's locked in some kind of closet of spiritual and emotional dysfunction, waiting for someone to show up with the key to free him from his pain. And that's when Jesus shows up. Now it interests me that this entire scene transpires on a beach. But from what we can tell, it's not the kind of beach we would go to. It is not Cozumel, it is not Aruba, it is not Oak Street, it's not Hollywood for the boys in the house, it's not Hollywood Beach. This stretch of sand is just near enough to the tombs for this deeply disturbed man to look up and see when Jesus' boat arrives and meet him when he steps on the shore. There's also a pig farm nearby on a hill with a bunch of swine slopping in troughs on the embankment. And what's more, we don't see a whole lot of locals around. This is not one of those moments where Jesus is mobbed by the crowds. It leads us to conclude that this place is nowhere anybody wants to be. It's a rancid, filthy place, overrun with flies and vermin and pollution and thing and just organisms that are drawn to stench and rotting waste. And of course, we'd expect to find someone this profoundly troubled and socially rejected in a place like this. We don't, we're not surprised when we drive down Lower Wacker and see dozens of homeless people. We are not amazed and frustrated when we see homeless folks looking through trash behind restaurants. They sort of are part of that landscape. And so this is someone, we say, well, you know, this is someone who, for whatever reason, has gotten comfortable in dead places. This is someone who knows it's best to stay out of sight. This is someone who has learned how to live and survive in the ruins and the runoff of a community that wants nothing to do with him. But he's not alone in this place. Let's not stop with him. We also have to say, of course, Jesus is there. Jesus is there. Jesus is standing on this margin right in this place where nobody else seems to want to be, looking for the place where folks think they have nowhere else to go, in those margins. David Luce captures this idea when he writes, Jesus, the Jewish itinerant rabbi, proclaiming the coming kingdom of God, goes to an unclean land to meet a man possessed by an unclean spirit, living in an unclean place. This is, in short, 
the very last place Jesus should be, which, when you think about it, is right where God usually shows up. Now, somebody can say amen to that. I just want you to say okay. Amen. Where we least expect God is always where God is found. When we're in our lowest state and our most hidden, intentionally burrowed into places where death is near, this God of resurrection and light and life is made known long before we're ready to come out. God finds us where we are and meets us in our wastelands and invades our causes and he walks into these foul places of refuge where we hide just hoping we can find a place to be ourselves. Luke tells us that Jesus commands the evil to leave the man, but the first words we actually hear from Jesus are, what is your name? Not, what are you doing here? Not, what are you hiding from? Not, why aren't you different? Not, you know, why aren't you getting with the program and conforming to what everybody wants from you? No, the question is, what is your name? At first, the man doesn't get it because he's still gripped by forces that he can't control. But once he's clothed and collected, I have to believe he sees that this question is deeper than what are you called. It's more like, how would you like to be known? And the man at this point can't say it because he's been called so many things, or he's been labeled so many ways, that he's lost touch with the truth of who he is. And so in every sense, coming out begins with a coming to, an awakening of who we truly are and what we're meant to be. It starts with knowing, with a knowing that defies all sense of articulation, an awareness of something greater than words or labels or categories, a life-giving fullness that can't become real until we get free from forces that send us into hiding and negate the very life God intended to bring forth in and through us. What you mean? The power shifts right there. This man came to Jesus, but now Jesus, with that question, is commanding the man to come out, bring him into the light of his own truth, telling him he needs to claim the full purpose of his making. And once the command to come out is issued, there's just no turning back, y'all. The forces that control the man's mind and emotions know that it's over. At best, they negotiate a temporary housing agreement. Their, their, their nearby pig herd becomes their host, and the evil that overtakes these swine is so foul, it drives them to suicide. And so, yes, this is a, it's a strange tale. But for me, the oddest detail comes near the end. The arrival of a miracle-working rabbi doesn't seem to get the villagers' attention. The liberation of a madman doesn't garner any interest. It takes a bunch of possessed pigs diving off a cliff to bring them around. The text tells us when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Two verses below, we read, all the people asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. And Jesus solved a huge problem for them. The tormented man who wouldn't stay dressed was clothed and right-minded. They should be rejoicing. They should be pressing Jesus to work more miracles. And instead, they send him packing because they're afraid. And why are they afraid? Well, for starters, Jesus just ruined their business, right? He wiped out the local economy just to save a man that everybody else had written off. They wound up paying. It's an interesting turn there, right? But Jesus saw what the problem was. This man had been forced into hiding because no one would take the time or care to understand and accept him. And what we don't understand always terrifies us. The people that frighten us the most are the ones we don't get to know. 
And still, both the man and Jesus realized that the villager's inability to deal with his true and whole self wasn't enough to keep himself to stay hidden in the dead places. Simply because folks won't understand will not keep me in the closet. Simply because folks refuse to accept how I'm made is not strong enough to make me hide. That's the coming out message that comes out of this. Coming out wasn't an option for this man. It was an imperative. And so today, as we celebrate 50 years of LGBTQ activism and pride, not only are we commanded to come out, to live into the truth of however we may be made according to whatever labels we want to apply to ourselves, regardless of what that is, we're also commanded to encourage and lift one another up so that we can all come out. How many people do we know who've been written off, prematurely sent to the tombs, restrained and then forgotten? How many souls do we know who've lost all sense of being because they've become ensnared in how they've been seen or labeled? What of those legion-possessed lives around us who are trapped in a culture of empire and repression where individual rights are? But what about those folks? What around us needs fixing? And how are we going to do that work? We are commanded to come out, not simply because it's good for us. We're commanded to come out because when we live truthful and free lives, others that live around us can also be truly free. When we come out, oh yeah, we bring everyone with us. Everyone with us. Not just the ones that are with us when we come out, but everybody we meet. I scare the day. I, I work in a, I'm a creative director and I, I work, I call them C-suites and, and high level uh, corporations, big companies. And I scare the daylights out of folks. But I just am who I am. I am just out. That doesn't mean that I come in, you know, with pinwheels in my hair and stuff. <laughs> no. But you know what? I just drop things. I'm out. This is who it is. And it liberates people when we do that. When we are nervous and worry about what folks are going to think, we don't enable them to think. Do you hear me? Harvey Milk reminded us so often that if we don't come out, they can't come along with us. So what is your name? How do you want to be known? What is your truth? Come out. Come out and live into all that you were meant and made to be, regardless of what that may be or how others might define it or regard you. That's the command that's before us this day. Amen. Without blame, without shame, without 